Hi everyone, welcome to Peterman Island. Uh, I'm Ron Levine. I'm the principal investigator of the Antarctic Site Inventory Project. Very happy that everybody from the National Geographic Endeavor is here, our mother ship. Uh, we do our shipboard surveys from uh, the Endeavor. And here at Peterman, uh, Oceanides, a research and education organization, uh, runs a focus monitoring project. We're keeping close track of the Adelie and Gentoo penguin populations here and trying to see what's happening. And what's happening is a lot. The Adelie population has plummeted by 50% throughout the peninsula and certainly here at Peterman. Uh, the Gentoos are rising. They're doing quite well in this warming environment. Peterman is superbly placed for the research project we're doing. It's at the southern end of the range for the Gentoo penguin, the northern end of the range for the Adelie, and it just so happens that we also have a hundred year perspective on the populations here from the French expedition when Jean-Baptiste Charcot came here in 1909. Jean-Baptiste Charcot, the great French explorer. First expedition on the vessel, the Francais, second expedition on the vessel called the Pourquoi Pas, the Why Not. So much great science was accomplished then. When he was here, there were about a thousand Adelie penguin nests and 12, only 12 Gentoo nests. It's totally flipped in the century. The Gentoos are up to more than 2,600 breeding pairs, and the Adelis are now down to only 410 pairs. Gentoos are very exciting to us because they're one of the indicators of change that the Oceanides project is following. Their numbers are increasing. They're deep divers, they eat everything, fish, krill. They seem to be succeeding quite nicely where the other two penguin species are not. So the fascinating thing we're looking at is the difference in fortunes of these two penguins in a part of Antarctica which is subject particularly to rapid change with global warming. We now know that over 58 years it's warmed by 9 degrees Fahrenheit in the winter in this region and 5 degrees on a year-round basis or in Celsius or centigrade, 5 in winter, 3 overall. That's huge, absolutely huge. I'm, I'm planning to dive today right here in Circumcision Harbor. This is where the Port Quapa was secured over the winter that Charcot spent here. I've dived this uh, area for five years now, and in that time I've already been able to see a few changes, more algae growing on the bottom in some areas, for example, which I attribute to less sea ice cover during the winter. Delis and chinstrap penguins are both highly krill dependent, and so one of the speculations is that Due to the decreased frequency of winter sea ice, the juvenile krill aren't able to survive through their first winter because they feed under that ice on the algae that grows at the bottom. So that means that we're having reduced populations of krill and probably therefore less success for those penguins that are really dependent on the krill. The Antarctic Peninsula is one of the three places on the planet warming fastest. The warming here is five times the global average so we're really here at the heart of the changes on the planet and our little penguin friends are really having to deal with this. Conservation everywhere depends on monitoring and assessment, censusing data, very basically. Out there all the time with our clickers and notebooks, keeping track of populations, whether they're rising or whether they're falling. So we go out into the field and we collect science on the birds around the island. Um, different data every day, but uh, in a fairly consistent and routine manner. And when I see changes happening to these animals, their food might be changing, the weather certainly is changing, there seem to be enough nesting rocks for them and there seem to be enough animals around for them to find mates. So it looks to be a food and a weather question. It's not going to be easy to solve, uh, but we in the Ocean IDs team are onto it. Penguins are essentially marine animals. They're seabirds. They depend on the ocean for their food supply. It's really their home. So by looking into the sea here and seeing how the underwater world is changing and trying to associate that with the changes they observe in the penguin colonies, we can get a better view of the big picture of changes going on here at Peterman. 
having the ships come in is, is a major reason that we've chosen this location. We know that tourists will visit this island, and for us, it, it allows us to sort of showcase some of the work we're doing. So we can speak to the passengers and the crew about the science that we're doing and, uh, and share it with the world, be, be good advocates and, and be good uh, stewards of, of Antarctic science and Antarctic flora and fauna. This is a microcosm of change. We are here, this project is devoted to creating those long-term data sets that will enable the managers of Antarctica, essentially the Antarctic Treaty Parties, to do what they're supposed to do under the treaty, to conserve Antarctica for posterity, to ensure that our grandchildren and great-grandchildren will have this laboratory of science and education available for them, just like it's available to us today. The real thing about Antarctica, though, is that it's totally humbling. Uh, I've worked here for an awfully long time. I've been coming for 20 years. And I, the more I come, the less I think I know. It's immensely complicated. One question leads to 10 or 15 others, and you can never be quite sure. And it is humbling. We humans often think that we steer the planet, but in reality, we're nothing but flea specks here. But I think the humility is good. Everybody is equal here. It's a really good model. Let's hope that it lasts and Antarctica stays uh, pristine for an awfully long time.